What became of the dream of dragons was a grievous tragedy born in a moment of joy. In the fateful year 259 AC, the king summoned many of those closest to him to Summerhall, his favorite castle, there to celebrate the impending birth of his first great-grandchild, a boy named Rhaegar, to his grandson Ares and granddaughter Rhaella, the children of Prince Jaehaerys. The tragedy of Summerhall was a spectacular attempt by Aegon V to hatch dragon eggs, and it failed spectacularly, killing most to all of the participants plus at least some probably most of, the witnesses. Those mentioned by name there were Ares, Rhaella, Jaehaerys, and little Rhaegar, who may have been born during the tragedy itself, all survived, as did the unnamed Shara, who was sister wife to Jaehaerys, and at least a few others. But King Aegon V, probably his queen, Betha Blackwood, and definitely Lord Commander Duncan the Tall, and likely more if not all of the Kingsguard, plus other members of the royal court, perished in the conflagration. Hello and welcome to another episode of History of Westeros Podcast, a podcast dedicated to George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire book series, as well as HBO's Game of Thrones. Today's episode, however, is focused on Summerhall, and thus it does have spoilers for all of the Dunk and Egg novellas, as well as the World of Ice and Fire. Yeah, it's kind of funny. I don't think it has a lot of straight up A Song of Ice and Fire spoilers. It's probably no. not spoiler for the main series. I hadn't really thought about that too much. <laughs> um, anyway, this is a Patreon voters episode. This episode is the second such episode voted on by our Patreon uh, pledgers. And the first episode in this vein was Sept and Barth episode, so these guys are really uh, hitting it out of the park with their selections. We're really happy to do this topic, and it really uh, grew on us in a lot of ways, which you'll see as we make it through this episode. I also want to welcome Joshua Hayes Cutter, called Joshua the Raw, History of Westeros' new first sword. We have added some new benefits and milestones. Uh, hopefully you can check that out. Mm -hmm. For more on that and how to get in on the voting process, you can check us out at patreon.com slash history of Westeros. I've been greatly looking forward to this topic, but I've also been a little scared of it. Supernatural topics can be extra difficult to just the huge range of possibilities. It's really hard to narrow things down sometimes. And just general lack of data. It's not like we know how magic works in mm -hmm. Westeros or in any of Planet's House or George's stuff. On top of that, George has specifically gone out of his way to make this topic mysterious. Digging deep uh, into an Islam of Black and Fire topic often makes me love it even more, and this is no exception. In fact, it's a standout. I'm really happy with how it came together. Yeah, Summerhall has some really surprising aspects to it, and explains a lot more than we could have hoped it would, despite so much of it really remaining mysterious. Hmm. Uh, we have no big answers here. Uh, not in just what happened, but in how it impacts the more recent and even the current A Song of Ice and Fire storyline. The best info we have on Summerhall, however, is a fragment from Archmaester Gildane in the World of Ice and Fire, who, prior to being an Archmaester, was Maester at Summerhall and was a witness to the event. Now, this fragment conceals a lot, but it also makes several things quite clear. Here are the lines. The blood of the dragon gathered in one. Seven eggs to honor the seven gods, though the king's own septon had warned. Pyromancers. Wildfire. Flames grew out of control. Towering. Burned so hot that... Died. But for the valor of the Lord Command... Command what? Command... Duh? Command yeah. D? <laughs> <laughs> Of course, Commandy, the Lord Commandy. Uh, so anyways, let's break that down a bit from a simple high level. We'll get far more precise and detailed as we move forward. Gathered in one is a strong indication that all the Targaryens were there, minus Maester Aemon, of course, up on the wall. <laughs> Aegon V and his son and heir uh, and his daughter, Prince Jaehaerys uh, and Princess Shara. Aerys, Rhaella, and the before-mentioned unborn Rhaegar, who popped out just before, during, or after, sometime around there. Yeah, but there's also a few others that we'll cover later on. We also have uh, seven eggs, despite the Septon's warning. Probably that the seven would not look very kindly on this. Yeah. And pyromancers and wildfire is the next thing there. Uh, flames growing out of control right after that. Well, that says a lot already, doesn't it? You can kind of get the gist of it just from that. As dangerous as wildfire is, it really doesn't take much imagination to think of something going wrong with it. And that the flames were towering is a strong indication that the hatching attempt occurred outdoors, probably in a courtyard. You'd need a castle the size of Hall to have indoor flames that reach towering heights. Hmm. Though, it could mean that the flames spread outdoors and climbed up the towers, or something like that. Or that they rose following the collapse of part of the castle. 
The last bit might indicate Archmaester Gildane was saved by the Lord Commander himself, which would be interesting. The King's Guard's first duty is to save the King, and then the heir, and then the rest of the royal family. Gildane would be pretty far down the list. <laughs> that Gildane was saved at all, if he was saved by the Lord Commander, may indicate the rest of the royal family was either already safe or already beyond saving at that point. Yeah, we aren't sure of this, though. It could just be that he is referring to him saving other notable people, such as the future King Ares and his wife Rhaella, who was pregnant with Rhaegar. Either way, Ser Duncan did not save King Aegon V or himself. And, of course, Aegon V is none other than Egg of Duncan Egg fame, and Lord Commander Duncan the Tall is, of course, Dunk from the same. When we reread them in advance of this episode, we were really struck by how many of the themes of these early novellas are also present at Summerhall. Yeah. From the very beginning of the first Duncan Egg, there's talk of dragons and how they've been gone for half a century. About 56 years, really, yeah. Yeah, and, so, and how Ser Arlen, who took Dunk on as a squire, blamed the longer winters and shorter summers on extinct dragons. Perhaps Planetos is better off with dragons. Perhaps not. But the attempt definitely went poorly for Sir Duncan the Tall. The next two Duncan eggs are focused on the Blackfire rebellions, first and second, respectively. Mm. The third also featured something very relevant to our interests, a dream of dragons that was true, but not literally true. The dragon in question turned out to be Egg himself, whose metaphorical hatching helped to unravel the rebellion. Little did he know it would be the first of many rebellions that Egg would deal with in his lifetime. The frequent rebellions during Aegon V's reign were one of the main reasons that he wanted to hatch, drag to hatch dragon eggs. Much harder to get people to rebel with you when the foe has, well, dragons. <laughs> so it seems like this, the tragedy of Summerhall, will wind up being the final Duncan Egg installment. That's depressing, though, isn't it? But not without some dark humor. <laughs> well, we're trying anyway. A boy named Egg, once told by his elder brother, Maester Aemon, to yeah. kill the boy, and eventually he did so. Boy Egg grew up and was thus figuratively killed by his adult self, King Aegon. But King Aegon was, in turn, killed by... Eggs! <laughs> yep, well, with a major assist from Wildfire. But yeah, the eggs had their revenge. How proud Yoke Boy of Radio Westeros must be of his cousins. I should think he'd be very ashamed of his brethren. After all, we like Aegon. <laughs> I do, at least. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So here's the rundown for this episode, just a rough uh, guide. Uh, part one is the history of Summerhall. Mm -hmm. Part two is the realm of Aegon V, treason and turmoil. Part three is dragon dreams. Part four is Enablers, the Wisdom, and the Ghost. Part five is The Ritual and Surprise. There will be more after that, a second episode, in fact. This episode took longer to prepare than expected, but that extra time was put to good use. Hooray for more material, and it won't take long to get it out. I think we'll have this one out of, mm, less than two weeks after this one, so not the <laughs> full cycle in any, in any case. So let's get started. Part one, the history of Summerhall. We'll start with a meta history slash analysis, like we often do to start off with. <laughs> it's the history of the history of Summerhall. <laughs> so actually the term, the tragedy at slash of either war, um, Summerhall is actually a fan in term. Grief is referred to in the books, but not tragedy, interestingly. But in the world of ice and fire, it is referred to as a tragedy. So, the Fanon terminology came before the world of ice and fire. Hearing that this is what Duncan Egg is building up to really explains that perception, though, doesn't it? George is just setting us up. The Duncan Egg series are all <laughs> happy and fun, <laughs> but they're all going to die. <laughs> <laughs> Summerhall isn't mentioned for the first time until A Storm of Swords, actually. But George R. R. Martin started with the clues and parallels earlier than that. Some of them made it out alive, but we don't have a complete list of them, nor the names of those who died at Summerhall. One particularly important figure who probably did was Queen was the Queen herself, Betha of House Blackwood. Like I said, we're not 100% certain she was there, as she may have died before the event. But if she was alive, she was there. We're yeah. pretty certain of that. Now, even before her name was revealed in the World of Ice and Fire, we had seen her name before. Davos's ship was Black Betha. Both Queen and ship alike per perished from wildfire. Wow. <laughs> Well, later we'll talk about how the wildfire scene on the Blackfire provides us, on the Blackfire, on the Blackwater, <laughs> provides us with a wealth of information on what might have happened at Summerhall, as well as providing some eerie parallels. Summerhall mm -hmm. also stands out in the way it is presented to us as a mystery. Unlike elements of the story that are mysterious due to lack of attention, Summerhall is presented as something that we're explicitly supposed to know is a mystery. What I mean, for example... 
there are subtle mysteries. Like, for example, where is the sword Blackfire? Which mm -hmm. we, we know we'll, we'll, t we'll be talking about more later. This is subtle because the sword isn't actually mentioned in any of the five main A Song of Ice and Fire books. So George isn't actually drawing our attention to it. Us obsessed <laughs> fans, we're the ones <laughs> bringing that out and being like, hey, where's Blackfire? George, yeah. for all we know, George doesn't even consider it important. He probably does. But yeah. still, the, the, that's, that's a very big dichotomy in the type of mystery. Yeah, Summer Hall, on the other hand, is mentioned several times, and most of the mentions speak very vaguely of it on purpose. George intentionally wants us to realize, hey you, reader, Summer Hall, it's mysterious <laughs> and important. Got it? <laughs> yeah, well, we hear you. I, I only hope our attempt at unraveling this mystery is worthy. And incidentally, though it sucks to hear the answer to that, you know, uh, question I posed, <laughs> about where the sword Blackfire might be is, it could be answered by this tragedy of Summerhall. Really, Aegon could have, if he had it again, he could have brought it with him and then it could have been destroyed by the wildfire. Yeah. That's kind of sad. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll, we'll, we'll be talking about that more. That's a, that would be a large tangent to get into. Mm -hmm. But we have some less fatalistic theories and ideas on where Blackfire may have ended up. We'll have to wait for, we, uh, for the dedicated episode that we'll be doing on that sword eventually. <laughs> so now let's get into in-world history. Daron II, this is a quote here, by the way, Daron, raised a great seat in the Dornish marches near to where the boundaries of the Reach, the Stormlands, and Dorn met. Calling it Summerhall to mark the peace he had created, it was more palace than castle and lightly fortified at best. In the years to come, many sons of House Targaryen would hold the seat as Prince of Summerhall. The intent of the place is quite distant from how it ended. Mm -hmm. That's... An understatement. <laughs> yeah. At least. yeah, it was built in 188. I almost said 1988. <laughs> <laughs> the year after Princess Daenerys, King Daron's much younger sister married Prince Maron Martell, finally bringing Dorne into the realm. After so many failed attempts at conquest, peace prevailed. Summer Hall was built in celebration of that, and in a very precise location. Yeah, it was a happy place, and it symbolized peace and unity. It was probably intended to remind us of a place like the Water Gardens. But it definitely didn't work out that way. Yeah, unfair as it may be, even I don't think of those <laughs> things when I think of it. In general, it's all about the tragedy, the dragon eggs, who was there, the mystery. That's what <laughs> really draws our attention. But the side effect of that awesomeness is that it does overshadow some interesting things worth knowing. So let's let's chat about some of that stuff for a bit. For example, Summerhall is where Robert Baratheon won three battles in one day. Mm -hmm. Apparently all versus other Stormlords who were trying to meet up and combine their forces to fight Robert. So he said, hey, yeah. let's fight them all individually rather than together. That the place was chosen by a rally point by these Stormlords goes a long way towards showing how Summerhall was given its location. It was a strategic, important place. But it's interesting that it was a peaceful place in a strategic location. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, constructing Summerhall in the Dornish Marches near three different kingdoms with violent histories towards each other was a declaration of sorts, that this was a peaceful region now. Now ends the warring, the raiding, the lack of commerce ends. Yeah. Existing blood debts will go unpaid. So you could guess that quite a few hated this. <laughs> Summer Hall was probably very unpopular for with those who disliked Daron II's peaceful reforms. Marcher lords who wanted to keep fighting the Dornish, yeah. and Dornish who wanted to keep fighting the Marcher lords in particular. <laughs> Many of these were Blackfire loyalists, as it turned out. We can probably guess that the Blackfires, in general, didn't like the place. It's the anti-symbol that it yeah. was. <laughs> yeah, Summerhall was kind of an optional home for the king or his heirs. The heir to the throne was still the Prince of Dragonstone, but it wasn't always the next in line or second son who got Summerhall. Some who seemed to have first claim to it simply preferred to stay at court, such as the eventual Ares I and his younger brother, the half-mad Rhaegel. This incidentally explains how their even younger brother, Makar, the fourth son of King Daron II, wound up as Prince of Summerhall. Other residents were Daron the Drunken, son of Makar, who preferred it to Dragonstone, and possibly Valar or Mataris as heirs of Baylor Breakspear during his life and heirs to the throne after his death. Yeah, to be clear, Daron the Drunkard had it. He was the older brother of Makar, and when he died, Makar, the fourth son, took it over. He was like, went from first son to fourth son, skipping over mm -hmm. the second and third, even though they were both still alive. Anyway... Valar and Mataris both died in King's Landing during the Great Spring Sickness. Neither was at Summerhall when they died, so it doesn't seem like it was their home. Yeah. But they might have been visiting Maybe. King's Landing. <laughs> yes. Uh, Valar was hand to the king, so he, he was probably in King's Landing all the time. Yeah. 
during the relevant era, uh, Egg's reign, which was 233 to 259, well, Egg probably didn't get to spend much time relaxing at Summer Hall. The unlikely king was forced to spend much of his reign in armor, quelling one rising or another. So possibly one of his younger sons lived there. We have Duncan the Small, who was, you know, the Prince of Dragonflies. Uh, he possibly lived there. He gave up his claim to the throne, but that doesn't mean he lost all royal favor. Maybe? Aegon V clearly loved his children, after all, or yeah. in my opinion, and yours, I think, yeah. as well. <laughs> seems, yes. So it seems doubtful that this is what happened. Yeah. Uh, Prince Duncan's younger brother, the eventual Jaehaerys II, may have lived there, but you'd think he'd live on Dragonstone since he was the heir. Yeah, now Daron yeah. the Drunkard chose to live at Summer Hall, even though he was Prince of Dragonstone, yeah. but that was probably an outlier. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Uh, maybe Daron lived there. Daron, as in the warrior prince who was supposed to marry Lady Olena, who had no interest in women. <laughs> women. He died around eight years before the tragedy and around five years after rejecting Olena. <laughs> though, so someone would have lived there in between. Yeah, I guess so. They might have just left it semi-empty. Now, this son, Daron, the warrior prince who rejected Olena, his death may be really important to the whole saga because he died fighting rebels. This particular Daron is a perfect segue to mm. part two, the realm of Aegon the Unlikely, treason and turmoil. Uh, the aforementioned Prince Daron, he was slain while successfully putting down a rebellion of the rat, the hawk, and the pig, whom we know pretty much nothing about. <laughs> yeah. Just a name. <laughs> yeah, nothing. We can make guesses, but it would it'd just be pointless. Yeah. Uh, we do know that rebellion was a theme of Aegon V's reign, however, as well as his early life before becoming king. It was a problem for Aegon's father, his uncles, and his grandfather. It was a problem for his son, his grandson, and, wait, his grandson lost the rebellion. Yeah, that was that was yeah. a very large problem. Yeah. <laughs> that was the end so, of the Targaryens. So we're going to give <laughs> an overview of those rebellions real quick. The point here is to show just how constant rebellions were in the life of Aegon the Unlikely, and to show that the further living dragons fade from memory, the more bold the lords of Westeros grew, willing to defy the Iron Throne and even rebel against it entirely. Okay, so prior to being king, well, Egg was born just after the first Blackfire Rebellion, so it affected his life, but he didn't live through it. He helped unravel Blackfire too. was key in Blackfire, the, th the third Blackfire Rebellion, in a vague way we're unaware of. It's just said that he was important. We don't really know why. He was, but it's, defini it's definitively stated in the World of Ice and Fire that this is the case. His father was killed in the Peak Uprising. That's Makar. He was king for Blackfire four, the fourth Blackfire Rebellion, plus... He was around for the incident with Bloodraven and Aenys Blackfire, who was tricked into coming, thinking he would be one of the contenders for the throne, and was executed by Bloodraven, of course. Then the War of Ninepenny Kings, featuring another Blackfire pretender, came just after the tragedy. And then, of course, much later, Robert's Rebellion <laughs> itself, the final rebellion, as yeah. far as the Targaryens are concerned. <sighs> But still well before that and before Summerhall, Aegon faced rebellions from non-Blackfires, too. Yeah. We know that he had to send soldiers, for instance, into the Westerlands thrice during his reign, thanks to the weak and inept rule of Tydos, Tywin's father. But the big problems came from the issue of royal marriages. Barristan thinks... The Prince of Dragonflies loved Jenny of Oldstone so much he cast aside a crown, and Westeros paid the bride price in corpses. All three of the sons of the fifth Aegon had wed for love, in defiance of their father's wishes. And because that unlikely monarch had himself followed his heart when he chose his queen, he allowed his sons to have their way, making bitter enemies where he might have had fast friends. Treason and turmoil followed, as night follows day, ending at summer hall in sorcery, fire, and grief. <laughs> You know, he let his sons marry for love, not his daughter. <laughs> she had to take one for the team. She did. <laughs> but Prince Duncan's marriage was the big one. He fell in love with a peasant girl, Jenny of Oldstones, of course. And, but he was betrothed to the daughter of Lord Lionel Baratheon, the Laughing Storm. But it got worse for the king. His heir, Prince Jaehaerys, and his eldest daughter, Princess Shara, were set to marry Celia Tully and Luther Tyrell, respectively, and instead ran off and married themselves. <laughs> they were keeping those Targaryen traditions alive, no matter what mom and dad say, clearly. <laughs> Gotta re represent. <laughs> the youngest son, Prince Daron, uh, that we mentioned already, he was betrothed to Olena Redwine, right? And that mm -hmm. Olena, yes, yeah. the Queen of Thorns. But Daron liked other men. So <laughs> Olena was probably not being honest when she claimed that she was the one that put a stop to this betrothal. <laughs> it's more like his, uh, 
his uh, orientation, so to yes. speak. Yes. We don't know what happened to Celia Tully, but Luther Tyrell and Olena Redwine ended up together, as you might know. Yeah, Luther got himself a different sort of queen. A queen of thorns. <laughs> these, ma these marriages upset the Tyrells, the Tullys, and the Redwines to, to an uncertain degree, possibly involving rebellion, while the Baratheons were angered to the point that the Laughing Storm declared himself the new Storm King. Yeah. This rebellion ended after Duncan the Tall defeated this new Storm King in single combat without killing him in a trial by combat. Uh, amends were made, and it resulted in the marriage of Aegon's remaining child, his daughter Rael, to Lord Ormond Baratheon, the Laughing Storm's heir. The union was the eventual basis, of course, for Robert's claim to the throne during his rebellion, and Stannis and Renly's as well, of course, as Rael was their grandmother. That's right. Robert's rebellion ended the Targaryen dynasty, but the rebellions of in Aegon V's time, they mostly amounted to just being costly... And significant in a way, but ultimately lacking personal loss for Aegon himself. They always won, in other words. He, he had to fight all these rebellions, but he just kept winning. It was just like a nuisance. And certainly people died. Certainly his for some of his friends and people that mattered to him died. But it wasn't until his son Daron died that something that, was, that hit really close to home, I think, as far as we know. This is the best information we have. So I have a feeling the death of his son Daron was different. This, was, this, this started maybe him down a new line of thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe it might might just have been a turning point. And this rebellion that killed his son wasn't related to the marriages or the black fires or anything similar. It was we don't know what the deal was with the rat, the hawk, and the pig. Yeah. Maybe maybe it was somewhat related, and we we just don't know. But uh, what we do know is that they tried to kill Princess Elora at a masked ball. Why we just, it's, this whole thing is really confusing. I I have a lot of questions. I'd like to talk more about it sometime. But yeah. again. Big mystery. Yeah. Uh, it happened long before the rebellion proper, and, you know, we, won't, we just won't go there, basically. Yeah, we shan't <laughs> go there. <Yeah. laughs> Aegon, well, again, what we do know is that the great lords of the realm chafed at and sometimes wouldn't accept Aegon V's many pro-small folk reforms. His time among the hedges showed him the plight of the small folk, and he had the wisdom and willpower and foresight to grant them additional rights and freedoms. From the world of ice and fire... The most outspoken of his foes went so far as to denounce Aegon V as a bloody-handed tyrant intent of depriving us of our God's given rights and liberties. Whoa. <laughs> Hence so much rebellion. And this time it's personal. No, seriously though, if any one thing was a trigger for his desire for dragons to become a bona fide quest, a legitimate effort instead of a dream, it would be the death of his son. That's a big yeah. one, right? You and the timeline fits well enough. Daron's death was in 251. The tragedy was about eight years later. Yeah. If the revolt was a result or of response to King Aegon's reforms, he could take it even harder. He could blame himself for putting his son in harm's way because of his own reforms. So that he could, he could, you know, he could blame himself. Yeah, Aegon V was not ignorant of history. He would know that he was living in the post-dragon era of House Targaryen. And he would know that rebellions were far, far less common during those times. Not only were they rarer, but they were just less damaging. The Targs during those times would just put someone down with dragons and everyone would be like, oh, yeah, that's why we weren't doing this. Dragons, <laughs> <Yeah>. right. <laughs> Basically just if only Aegon himself had dragons and he knew it. Aegon V was oft heard to say that had he only had dragons, as the first Aegon had, he could have remade the realm anew with peace and prosperity and justice for all. So he began to learn what he could on the hatching of dragon eggs. We're told... The last years of Aegon's reign were consumed by a search for ancient lore about the dragon breeding of Valyria, and it was said that Aegon commissioned journeys to places as far away as Ashai by the Shadow, with the hopes of finding texts and knowledge that had not been preserved in Westeros. Yeah, I have to wonder if Shiera Seastar was still around at this point. I mean, who better to consult or send to Ashai, even if she was in her 70s? Right. She stayed youthful too, right? She, oh, yeah. <laughs> she was whispered yeah. to do things to make herself younger. Maybe that actually worked. <laughs> it's too bad, though, that Aegon had no access to the writings of our friend and famous... <laughs> our, he, he's famous. Our friend. He's, just our, he's our man, our buddy, Septon <laughs> Barth. But Baylor the Blessed, Patron burned saint. Barth books. <laughs> patron saint, yeah, that's right. He's the patron saint of history of Westeros. Oh. So all we have left is crappy alliteration. <laughs> a few copies may have survived, but it's doubtful Aegon V had one, even though maybe there were some in Dorne or something, because Dorne wasn't in the realm when Baylor burned the books. Yeah. But if those unnatural histories had been around, it might have saved Duncan Egg. I kind of doubt they had yeah. a copy or else. I don't, I don't know. They would just, yeah. <laughs> they wouldn't, I don't think they would have made these mistakes. Yeah. But he didn't know better, basically. Yeah. 
Perhaps because of, or in addition to, his search, Aegon's desire for dragons became less and less about whether it was even possible, but rather how he would make it happen. Yeah, he should have married a Dornish woman. <laughs> would have gotten her books. But uh, much of Aegon's confidence relates to a phrase repeated many times in connection to dragons, dragon eggs, and many different Targaryens. This is part three dreams of dragons that's right a very large portion of the research for this episode comes from outside a song of ice and fire it's largely though not entirely in duncan egg and the world of ice and fire all three of the duncan egg novels are available now on audible.com and so is the world of ice and fire if finding time to read is difficult go to historyofwesteros.com and click on the audible trial link you'll get 30 days at zero cost and that comes with a free book download now i'm a roy dotrice fan but not everyone is and well, he's not the reader of the Duncan Egg audiobook, so that's that's not a hang-up for you. <laughs> <laughs> she is one of those not a big fan of him. No, no, I don't like Brian and <laughs> Brian. Petire and yeah. Targaryens. People but... seem to either really like him or really not. And I, I, I can get not liking him, but I, I like him. Audiobooks are a great deal to at least try. It's free for you to at least give it a shot. Uh, you can immerse yourself in Westeros while working out, doing chores, commuting, taking a shower, whatever, while sim simultaneously helping us grow. So it's yeah. a win-win. Right on. Anyways, let's move onward. Here's a quote. As he grew older, Aegon V had come to dream of dragons flying once more above the seven kingdoms of Westeros. In this, he was not unlike his predecessors, who brought septons to prey over the last eggs, mages to work spells over them, and maesters to pour over them. Though friends and counselors sought to dissuade him, King Aegon grew ever more convinced that only with dragons would he ever wield sufficient power to make the changes he wished to make in the realm and force the proud and stubborn lords of the Seven Kingdoms to accept his decrees. So Aegon went against the grain and ignored advice. And it ignored advice. <laughs> but we don't need to necessarily think this was evidence that he was becoming delusional or worse. Yeah. After all, this was a king who pretty consistently went against the grain. The marriages of his children, his life amongst the hedges, his quest to remake the realm with more power for the commons and less for the nobles. That was all progressive, perhaps radical, but certainly not insane. Though I guess some of the great lords would disagree. Yeah, and we bring this up because, thanks to Summer Hall, a common enough perception of Aegon V, and indeed one frequently used in reference to the Targaryens in general, is the charge of insanity. <laughs> Whether setting in gradually or coming on early in life, it's an easy accusation to make because it does run in the family. Not only does it run in the family, but it hit Egg's brothers quite hard in particular, and his grandson was the Mad King, so... Yeah. But dragon dreams and looking for ways to bring them back does not qualify as evidence of crazy. Yep, Trying saw. to bring back the dragons makes Aegon normal for a Targaryen king, really. More than half of the Targaryen kings after the dragons died out were involved in hatching attempts. That said, quite a few of them were arguably crazy, <laughs> but others were definitively not. Right. So in terms of making a case that Aegon V was mad by the time of Summerhall, well... There are some reasons to, to think that, but not this. We'll get to that later. For now, let's take a quick look at back at previous Targaryen attempts to hatch dragon eggs. The last dragon had died around 153, which is 47 years before Egg was born, 80 years about before his coronation, and about 106 years before the events at Summerhall. Egg on the Fifth's attempt wasn't the last, it was his last, but it wasn't the last <laughs> Targaryen's, nor was it anywhere close to the first. It went the most wrong, so it's got that going for <laughs> yeah, it. It does have that, going <laughs> that distinction <laughs> yeah, going for it. <laughs> now, so now a brief history of other Targaryen attempts to hatch eggs during their drag during this dragonless era. <sighs> Aegon the Third called the dragon mane because the dragon died <laughs> out during his reign. He actually may have tried the hardest besides wow. Aegon. He tried a variety of methods from what we can understand. And he brought like mages in. Yeah. Ugh. He did several things. He might be the only one who tried multiple times, wow. actually. <laughs> then we have uh, Daron the First. He has no attempts known, but he had a short reign. Yeah, he went straight to yeah. attacking Dorne and then died. And then we have Baylor, <laughs> of course, who had prayer. Yeah, he prayed over his yeah, eggs. Yeah, like, good luck with that. <laughs> Viserys had a really short reign, like a year or so, but I'm sure he would have tried because we're told that he is the one that urged Aegon the Third to try it in the first place. And he is a guy that's like Tywin. He is very <sighs> practical. Understands power, not crazy, no evidence of that at all. So okay. his attempts, you got to think, with him leading <laughs> the way, that gives it some credibility. Because he yeah. was definitively not crazy. Yes. He was an extremely capable man. <sighs> then we also have uh, Aegon the Fourth, the, the unworthy. <laughs> Just a little more crazy. Yeah. He <laughs> was, if he wasn't crazy, he was certainly a, 
a know, fool. big loser and a fool. <laughs> <laughs> wooden dragons, he made wooden dragons that shot wildfire. He also designed seven of them. I don't know what the There's... deal with the seven is when that, like, trying what are to they... Placate them. Yeah, they're trying, yeah. It's, it, it's a political thing, I think. Yeah. I think it's, we'll, we'll talk about why maybe Aegon had yeah. the same reasons. Darren the second, we don't really hear much about him with regards to dragons, but he was a Faith of the Seven type pious guy. Even though Baylor prayed over his eggs, I have a, I doubt that Darren the Second did much more than maybe that himself, and he yeah. might not have even done that. Yeah. Now, Ares the First, not the Mad King, Ares the First. This is Egg's uncle, not his grandson, who believed in the prince that was promised. He certainly believed the dragons would return. He Egg specifically mentions this. Yes. Um, then we also have uh, Makar's. Makar, Egg's father. We have no attempts known for him, and we, we personally think that it's kind of unlikely. He was a practical man. We just yeah. don't, don't think so. Maybe maybe he did. But it's maybe possible not. since Viserys is practical. We just don't, we just did, don't but know. But, no info, yeah, none at all. Uh, then we have Jaehaerys II. We have none known. Perhaps he was traumatized by Summerhall, and plus he had a short reign. Yeah, as soon as as soon as soon uh, his reign started, basically he had the War of Nine Penny Kings, and yeah. his reign was only about three years, so... Yeah, but of course, he was also probably traumatized by Summerhall. He may have not been too eager to repeat that. Yeah. Now, Ares II, oddly, he tried what might have been similar to what killed his grandfather, King Aegon. Pyromancers <laughs> and wildfire. Of course, that didn't end up killing anybody as far as we know. But it's quite possible that the impact of Summerhall on Ares was huge. He'll be a major subject later, as in, in the second episode we're doing, <laughs> which is mostly going to be focused on the aftermath of Summerhall. <laughs> so, here's a message from Stannis on what he thought of all this. The dragons are done. The Targaryens tried to bring them back half a dozen times and made fools of themselves or corpses. Or both. <laughs> <laughs> but hold your antlers, Stannis. We can't forget Daenerys, the only success story and the only female on the list. Yeah, clearly the eggs needed a mother, not a father. Uh, but the huh. <laughs> quote that we began this part with said that King Aegon started dreaming of dragons and in his own certainty for their hatching late in life. But even in his early life, it was on his mind. We have some serious, very serious double foreshadowing right here. Egg lowered his voice. Someday the dragons will return. My brother Daron's dreamed of it, and King Ares read it in a prophecy. Maybe it will be my egg that hatches. That would be splendid. Would it? Dunk had his doubts. Not Egg. Eamon and I used to pretend that our eggs would be the ones to hatch. If they did, we could fly through the sky on Dragonback, like the first Aegon and his sisters. I, and if all the other knights in the realm should die, I'd be Lord Commander of the King's Guard. Well, of course, some eggs do hatch eventually, and the dragons did return, but not <laughs> eggs. His was green and white. Close, but definitely not Viserion nor Rhaegal. Certainly not Valerian. <laughs> yeah, and Duncan does end up Lord Commander, and there was much rejoicing. Yay. <laughs> Sometime after he gets his genes into the Tarth line, perhaps. Yeah, yeah we would yeah. think so. Yeah, yeah, he's got to somehow impregnate one of... Brienne's predecessors, right? Yeah. Or ancestors. <laughs> so in A Feast for Crows, Maester Aemon later laments the stream of dragons that has plagued his family since they died out. Here's a great quote. The last dragon died before you were born, said Sam. How could you remember them? I see them in my dreams, Sam. I see a red star bleeding in the sky. I still remember red. I see their shadows on the snow, hear the crack of leathern wings, feel their hot breath. My brothers dreamed of dragons too, and the dreams killed them. Every one. Every one, huh? Eamon had three brothers, so let's check that out. Egg died at Summerhall. One. Arian with wildfire. And Daron, well, he died of a pox, but he was haunted by dragon dreams to the point that it seems to have broken him early in life. From Eamon's perspective, he was dead long before the pox okay, got that's him. that's three, yeah. <laughs> the common theme with these dragon dreams that killed Eamon's brothers was that the the dragons were literal and actual in the dreams, but every time the reality turned out to be Targaryens, i.e. metaphorical dragons. This repeated mistake proved deadly, as Aemon says. These kinds of errors with regards to dream and prophecy is something we talk about regularly in A Song of Ice and Fire. How misinterpretation of these metaphors has been easy to get wrong, and sometimes the mistakes are costly, as we've said. Think Jojen. And the sea pouring over the walls of Winterfell, turning out to be Theon's Iron Men taking the castle. In other words, they had warning of that and didn't know how to interpret it. Melisandre has made plenty of mistakes like this, which we hardly even need to go over. Yeah. They're common enough. We don't need examples. George has shown us the, prophecy, the, the problems of prophecy many times. Yeah, including in the Duncan Egg novellas, where we find an incredibly perfect example. The prophetic dream of Daemon II, Blackfire, who foresaw that a dragon would hatch at White Walls, which he believed would ignite his rebellion. He also foresaw Ser Duncan wearing the white of the Kingsguard, he was right about that one, but the dragon turned out to be none other than Egg himself. 
Far from being a catalyst for the second Blackfire Rebellion, it ended it. So was there correspondence between King Aegon and Master Aemon? Maester Aemon <laughs> during this process or prior to the hatching attempt? It seems pretty likely, considering how close they were, and given Aemon's level of knowledge in, in general, and Egg's you know, searching all yeah. over for information. So we can yeah. only speculate on whether Maester Aemon was for or against a hatching, but given his correspondence with Rhaegar and his open-mindedness towards prophecy in general and the supernatural, I'd suspect he'd be a little, at least a little optimistic, if not, like, very for it. Yeah. Uh, maybe not after the fact, but prior to Summerall, yeah. He sees them in his dreams, too, after all, as we just yeah. showed. Now, here's a clear, now, we need to clarify something here. There's dragon dreams, perhaps common to Targaryens. It's not entirely clear. We've seen them from other people. But there are the rarer prophetic dreamers who we actually call dragon dreamers, and that seems to be a higher level. Yeah. Egg was not a true dragon dreamer that we know of, nor was Aemon. Their dreams were the normal human kind of dreams, meaning desires, things they wanted to come true, things they were thinking about. But, yes, they did dream of them at night, too. Perhaps they were even vaguely prophetic, you know, perhaps. Yeah. But regardless, most Targaryens stand well apart from those who have shown real potent prophetic powers that can be used more regularly. Bloodraven himself says, There have always been Targaryens who dreamed of things to come since long before the conquest. In this case, he was speaking of Daemon II, who had these prophetic powers, despite his mistakes of interpretation. Yeah, Daron the Drunkard, uh, Egg and Aemon's eldest brother, certainly did as well. Daenerys herself may have them. She yeah. certainly had some, at least the minor version with her mother of dragons talk in her head and yeah. her the feeling, the, her connection to the egg and all that stuff. Yeah, Daenys the Dreamer, of course, looms large on this list, given her name. For without her <laughs> house, tar without her, House Targaryen would never have come to Westeros and they would never have avoided the doom. And surely there are many other Targaryens. Yeah. In many ways, these prophetic powers are similar to, say, green dreams, a la Jojin, or fire readers like Melisandre, Thoros, or Makoro. Those have no blood ties to House Targaryen. Shireen has dreams of dragons eating her, perhaps foreshadowing her death at the hands of fire, possibly at her father's hands, who is one quarter dragon himself. A lot of possibilities there, but that could be what it's foreshadowing, indeed. Oh. Now, Damon II and Melisandre are good examples, as we said, of how things can get pretty bad because of a misinterpreted prophecy. And many of us have settled on the idea that prophecy cannot be trusted. Well, we're not so sure. It may be that certain prophecies cannot be trusted, but certain prophets have shown themselves to be inerringly accurate. For example, the aforementioned Makoro. Mm -hmm. Of those which have had a chance to come to pass, all have been basically perfect. Some of Makoro's prophecies, maybe we haven't seen the full result of yet, but of the ones that have come to pass, he is perfectly accurate so far. So, that's pretty telling. Yeah, yeah. Before him, though, we saw another who fired off quite a few prophecies, quite a few visions. Not once was she wrong, and her record of accuracy may have contributed greatly, though indirectly, to the tragedy of Summerhall. That's right. As we move on to part four, first a message from Peter Blaze of Emerald Isle, captain of the Werewood Wanderers. To long lives, quick deaths, cold beer, and warm women. You oh. can do worse than that. <laughs> so we have uh, many fun titles and other benefits available at patreon.com slash history of Westeros, of course. All right, yeah. Onward to part four. Enablers, the ghost and the wisdom. The ghost. You are cruel to come to my hill, cruel. I gorged on grief at Summer Hall. I need none of yours. Be gone from here, dark heart. Be gone. There was such fear in her voice that Arya took a step backward, wondering if the woman was mad. Yes, the ghost of High Heart. Called a wood witch by many, a child of the forest by a few, she was brought to court by Denny of Old Stones via her beloved Duncan, Prince of Dragonflies. There's a lot that can be said about her, but we're going to try to keep the parts, or try to keep to the parts that are relevant to Summerhall. Yeah, so the ghost is about three feet tall. She has red eyes and white hair, and she lives amongst weirwood stumps with significant connections to the powers of the old gods. She likely looked more youthful back in the time of Summerhall, but she'd still be quite a sight, we'd think. Yeah, if you've ever scratched your head at how this dwarf albino woman ended <laughs> up a resident of the Targaryen royal court, well... <laughs> If that seems strange to you, uh, you're not alone. Um, it's supposed to seem odd, I think. But looking at it in this light, it actually fits. Yeah, after, after all, the Brotherhood Without Banners relied on her. Why? Because she kept giving them accurate information. Yeah, she's always right. Yeah. Yeah, after all, <laughs> here's a famous passage of hers. The old gods stir and will not let me sleep. I dreamt I saw a shadow with a burning heart butchering a golden stag. I. 
I dreamt of a man without a face, waiting on a bridge that swayed and swung. On his shoulder perched a drowned crow with seaweed hanging from his wings. I dreamt of a roaring river and a woman that was a fish. Dead she drifted, with red tears on her cheeks. But when her eyes did open, oh, I woke from terror. All this I dreamt, and more. Like this one, most prophecies we see are loaded with metaphor. Characters are always seen in symbolic form. Targaryens are dragons. Baratheons are stags. Tullys are fish. Euron is a drowned crow. A man without a face is a faceless man. These are straightforward enough once you find the right matches. The Quaith's prophecies are another great example of this. Danny is overwhelmed by dark flame, <laughs> sun, sun, kraken, lion, griffin, etc. Those are pretty easy to figure out once you set your mind to it, but uh, like in the moment when you're reading it the first time, you're probably mm -hmm. like, especially because that was in Clash and some of these characters hadn't even been introduced yet. Yeah. But here's another. We're taking her to River Run to her mother. Nay, said the dwarf, you're not. The black fish holds the rivers now. If it's the mother you want, seek her at the twins, for there's to be a wedding. See, the metaphor is present. She refers to Brendan Tully as the black fish. But this is not a prediction or a telling of the future. She's seeing what's happening then and now. So no matter how crazy she looks or seems, or how creepy she might be, the bottom line is that she's really good at what she does. Her visions are either extremely clear, or she's really good at interpreting them, or both. We're not going to quote all her prophecies, okay. but another peculiar thing about her is how comprehensive and varied her visions are. She's aware of all these different things happening all over the realm. She's like some sort of news source, like <laughs> a World Wide Web thing. <laughs> She's not focused on one king or region or future event. She sees things in the north, the Vale, the Iron Islands, the Riverlands. She foresaw the Red Wedding, the Purple Wedding, the assassination of Balon. I mean, <sighs> all these things. So now, imagine her at court. Perhaps she was helpful in knowing which lords would rebel or something along those lines. Yeah. The specifics don't really matter, but it's really, really easy to see the king and others catching on to just how accurate she was and growing to trust her over time. Mm -hmm. It was her that predicted that the prince that was promised would be born of the Targaryen line. Jaehaerys arranged the marriage of his son and daughter Aerys and Rhaella because of this. So that makes the idea of her being highly trusted very strong and likely indeed. You don't, you don't, you don't go around believing prophecies told by people and then not trust them on like other things. So, given her seeming ability to see a broad variety of events, wouldn't she have foreseen at least some aspects of the tragedy? Perhaps she predicted that things would go wrong and no one listened to her. That flies in the face of this case we just made for her accuracy, giving her credibility. So it's possible, but kind of hard to name that as the most likely possibility. Yeah. Her line, I gorged on grief at Summerhall, could indicate the obvious, meaning it was a horrible, traumatic event where a lot of people died. I mean, who wouldn't grieve over that? But there's an element to her reaction to Arya and the situation in general that speaks to a deeper meaning, I think. She explodes at Arya. It's like she's angry in addition to being deeply sad. And again, she was a trusted, a trusted prophet at court, seemingly. Can you really imagine Aegon V planning an egg hatching ceremony and not consulting his trusted prophet? Ugh. I'm sure her opinion was involved somehow. Yeah. And it's, it's not really very hard at all to imagine her seeing a dragon born at Summerhall because one was born at Summerhall. A literal dragon turned out to be a metaphorical dragon, Prince Rhaegar. And so this can explain that anger, the notion that she blames herself. Yeah, there are several ways she can blame herself. Not only might it have been her prediction of a dragon born at Summerhall, which was badly misinterpreted. Her prophecy regarding the prince that was promised was was what resulted in the marriage of Ares and Rhaella, and that resulted in Rhaegar, who was the dragon born at Summerhall, so it all kind of came full circle. Yeah. Though many do think that she died at Summerhall, it's just Sir Barristan, she was she was one of the survivors, clearly. So maybe she, uh, I don't know, stood near the door? Her description <laughs> isn't exactly something you picture as built for speed. I'm like picturing a Speedy three-foot dwarf yeah. with a cane. <laughs> I would love to know if she's aware of Daenerys, you know? Yeah. She doesn't. She sees much, but perhaps she doesn't see Essos. Yeah, maybe she knows and just doesn't want to speak of it. Yeah, that would be uh, interesting to find out. Yeah, <laughs> so this may explain why King Aegon thought his egg-hatching ceremony would work, though. We have a decent, though incomplete, conception of what that method was, but a very good understanding of who made the most convincing case as to why their method was best. Now, Archmaester Gildane's fragment says nothing of the Ghost of Highheart, but it does say wildfire, and it does say pyromancers. So let's talk about the wisdom. This talk of a stone dragon. Madness, I tell you. Sheer madness. Did we learn nothing from Arian Brightfire? From the Nine Mages? From the Alchemists? Did we learn nothing from Summerhall? No good has ever come from these dreams of dragons. That came from Alistair Florence. Hmm. We're not sure about those nine mages, as the World of Ice and Fire refers to Aegon III attempting to use their arts to kindle a clutch of kings. 
But Arian, Brightfire, Summerhall, Alchemists, those are all Wildfire related. As we all know, the source of that stuff, or their preferred moniker, the substance, <laughs> is the Pyromancers. <sighs> it's time to bring them into this as they play a major role. Yeah, so compare Ares' behavior before and after the defiance of Duskendale to Egg's trauma of losing his son Daron to other rebellious lords. So perhaps the Pyromancers got involved with Egg on the Fifth in a similar fashion. You know, when his guard was down and he was maybe a bit desperate for a solution, and perhaps by displaying the same confidence they would later offer the Mad King, they would gain Aegon's interest. It seems that they may have had some influence before this as well. Yeah, the infamous Aryan Bright flame we've talked about several times. That's Egg's older brother. Yeah. He had that incident when he drank Wildfire and died, yeah. of course. As crazy as he was and drunk at the same time, apparently, what planted that notion in his <laughs> head in the first place that Wildfire had anything whatsoever to do with dragons in the first place? How do you get from <laughs> the substance <laughs> the pyromancers make to thinking dragon? Where does that... What is that? You know, how do you how do you get there? <laughs> now, Arian's death was 27 years before Summerhall, and the Pyromancers have been around a long time, long time, with an up and down reputation among the Targs, from what we can tell. But what we don't hear of them having anything to do with any of those previous hatching attempts. We went through all those lists of all the prior Targaryen kings who tried to hatch dragons. Wildfire, no hint mm -hmm. of Wildfire being used in any of those things. Yeah. Yet. The Pyromancers were part of the final two attempts prior to Danny's successful attempt, which did not involve Wildfire. Yeah. So joke's on them. <laughs> yeah. So a look at them, at the Pyromancers. In A Song of Ice and Fire, the Pyromancers are shown repeatedly to be unlikable, just plain unlikable. They're yeah. associated with helping the Mad King live out his cruel perversions and with being like cultish and weird in a bad way. Not the good kind of cultish and weird, like, <laughs> like the House of Black and White. Yeah. But uh, they're, you know, they're a lot like the phrase to us. Uh, really easy to despise for a variety of reasons, but you know, ultimately really dangerous. Our disgust can serve to disguise that they are quite good at what they do, at least when it comes to wildfire. Well, they don't really seem to do much else besides wildfire, <laughs> I guess. Right. Not anymore. Yeah, that's sad. They came up big time for the Lannisters against Stannis in the Blackwater, for example. So when people hear them connected to Mad King Ares, it fits with the crazy, unlikable theme we've been given. It doesn't work that way when connecting them to Egg, who I assume most of us like very much. So how did they get hooked up in the first place? <laughs> the Pyromancers seem to have quite a lot of confidence when it comes to dragon eggs. Knowing what we know now, that something went, something awful went wrong with Wildfire at Summerhall and no dragons hatched, well... Yet, somehow, this happens. This happens from Cersei's POV after the apparent fall of Dragonstone to forces under Sir Loras. Yeah, did command. this guy learn nothing from yeah. his predecessors? Lord Helene of the Guild of Alchemists presented himself to ask that his pyromancers be allowed to hatch any dragon's eggs that might turn up upon Dragonstone, now that the Isle was safely back in royal hands. If any such eggs remained, Stannis would have sold them to pay for his rebellion, the Queen told him. She refrained from saying that the plan was mad. Ever since the last Targaryen dragon had died, all such attempts had ended in death, disaster, or disgrace. So Helene has this confidence, despite the failure of the pyromancers of Egg's time, something even Cersei, not exactly a student of history, is at least aware of. Yeah, and here's a twist. It's quite likely it was Helene's own ancestor, or one close to him, expressing the same confidence to King Aegon. He tells Tyrion... The substance flows through my veins and lives in the heart of every pyromancer. We respect its power. But the common soldier, hmm, the crew of one of the Queen's Spitfires, say, in the unthinking frenzy of battle, any little mistake can bring catastrophe. That cannot be said too often. My father often told King Ares as much as his father told old King Jaehaerys. Yeah, so it's Helene's fathers have been these higher-ups in the, in the pyromancer's ranks. Now, how, however... Helene may not have been privy to the finer details of what happened in Summerhall. After all, the Pyromancers lost many of their senior membership to Jaime Lannister, who hunted them down after Ares' death, killing the most important ones. Yes, but the, scenes with, the scene with Cersei served as a pretty reasonable parallel to what started Egg down the road of his own dragon hatching plans. Aegon was already looking, already hopeful, perhaps a little desperate even, and the Pyromancers had confidence and the hottest su substance around. That's right. The pyromancers said that only three things burned hotter than their substance. Dragon flame, the fires beneath the earth, and the summer sun. <laughs> but this has been known for hundreds of years or more, and as we said before, they haven't been a part of previous attempts to hatch dragons that we know of, and there might be good reasons for that. Yeah, we brought up Septon Barth's writings before and how Egg didn't have access to them, but those before Baylor did have access to them, and we don't hear of them using wildfire. 
it may have been tried long ago and discarded, perhaps. Yeah. So basically, we're saying, the whole point of this episode, Summer Hollow was a lesson not to burn books. <laughs> burn books and your descendants will burn a lot. <laughs> to all of you. <laughs> so out of all that, here are the questions. Did the Pyromancers convince him because it's part of their deeply held beliefs, as Wisdom Helene indicates? Or did Aegon choose Wildfire because it was the next hottest thing available behind Dragonflyer and Volcanic... <laughs> activity, which uh. is the, what he meant by the fires of the earth, uh. which is where we've seen eggs hatched before. Uh. So did his research, the missions he sent abroad to Ashai and other places, or even his dreams help make this choice? No, why not all of the above? It doesn't uh. have to be one thing. It could be a confluence of reasons. Uh. One also wonders about Black Betha's influence. Was she for or against the hatching? Or was she already dead? An interesting thing to consider is the possibility that she was against it and hindered her kingly husband's talk of such. But if she died prior to Summerhall, that influence might have died with her, and a major voice speaking against this attempt may have, may have fallen to the wayside. We're told that many spoke out against the king's plans on this, and she may have been one of them. Her role in this is something we were looking forward to learning about one day. Mm -hmm. but, so we can't pit it on one person, one choice, or one influencer even. It was an unusual confluence of bravado, prophecy, timing, and maybe even some desperation, and maybe some loss of sanity. Yeah. Whatever the ingredients, whatever the logic or force of argument for or against, Aegon V was convinced that it would work. So convinced that he didn't really seem to be worried about potential risk, despite, you know, wildfire. <laughs> right, wildfire. Now, if, if Patreon isn't right for you, but you like the idea of getting our episodes early, a PayPal donation will make that happen, too. And if, and if you want, you can also get a shout-out. Like our friend and regular supporter, James Saunders, Lord of the Chicken Song. Lord James also sent us a lot of helpful notes during HBO Season 5, so... Cheers, James. We'll do the chicken dance in your honor. But not on camera. <laughs> right, not on camera. Because he's well. Uh, no, he won't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, onward to part five. <sighs> Just as Summerhall is a dichotomy of peace and tragedy, Aegon held this ceremony intended to create creatures capable of great destruction in order to ensure peace and remake the realm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Potentially a wonderful and laudable vision, but also a potential folly. And I'm not talking about what, because it went wrong. Yeah. Look what happens when there are too many dragons. You get the dance of yeah. them. <laughs> but arguably you get even more war without them. Yeah. Uh, note, again, the theme of rebellion we covered earlier. Yeah, while Summerhall has, you know, basically nothing directly in common with the dance, they are related in some interesting ways. I mean, the dance ended most of the Targaryen dragons, and Summerhall was an attempt to repair that damage. Yeah. And as the World of Ice and Fire says... It is unfortunate that the tragedy that transpired at Summerhall left very few witnesses alive, and those who survived would not speak of it. Figuring out who was there, who died, and who survived... That's a must for us as a subtopic, wouldn't you say? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's so we're gonna, kind of thing. So we're going to move on to the gathering. For the most part, we're looking at two main sources to figure out who was there. The royal family and the royal court. court. Okay, the court at the time, we don't have a lot of names. Small council, we, we don't really know any of the names other than Pycelle, who was a newly made Grand Maester, so he was kind uh -huh. of unlikely that he was in the inner circle, too new, to the, too yeah. new on the scene. And, of course, as you know, it turned out to be a Lannister toady. It's kind of uh -huh. doubtful that... Uh, egg included him mm -hmm. um, but we also the hand of the king we don't know who he was but whoever he was quite possibly he died at summer hall because right after summer hall jaharis who became the new king appointed a, a new lord uh, a new hand which was turned out to be lord ormond baratheon upon his succession which or uh, ascension rather which may suggest that whoever the hand was he died you know at summer hall and that's why no one was needed Yes, um, and we don't know the rest of the small council, but due to Betha's influence, possibly a Blackwood or two were on the council. And probably no Brackens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'm going to say definitely no Brackens. Now, what about some other people? Who else would have been there? Some pyromancer or other. Yeah. <laughs> Helene's great-grandfather, perhaps, uh -huh. and he probably had some assistance with him. I doubt it was just one pyromancer. <laughs> Sir Duncan the Tall, of course, was Lord Commander by then. He was between 66 and 68 years Jeez. old by then. Yeah, he was up there. I guess I guess Egg was kind of old to him too. He was yeah, he would have been. He was about fifty nine. Yeah, yeah. and Betha would have been just slightly younger if she was around. Kingsguard, I think all the Kingsguard was probably there. Maybe even Glendon Ball, who was part of Mystery Night. You know, he was he left uh, with Egg and Dunk to go journey with them, and he said he wanted to join the Kingsguard one day, yeah. and he certainly was a badass. So I could see him becoming friends with Dunk and Egg, joining the Kingsguard, and dying at Summerhall. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Yeah, um, one of the reasons that we think that uh, possibly all of the Kingsguard was killed was because shortly after Summerhall, a new Lord Commander was named. He was a young man, and we've all heard his name, Gerald Hightower, the White Bull. A young man named his Lord Commander is 
far from unheard of, but it is more common that a senior, more experienced member was given the honor of that post. Just makes sense. Yeah. It's definitely possible that there were no senior Kingsguard members left after Summerhall. It's possible that there were just no Kingsguard at all after Summerhall. So Sir Gerald might have just been the first and foremost of the new blood. Right, you also just expect, I mean, it's their job to save the king, and uh. the king didn't live, so, like, it would be kind of shameful <laughs> if they didn't. Harlan Grandison died in his sleep of old age just before the tourney of Harrenhal, which opened Jamie's spot. Since he was such an old guy, he may have, he may have already been in the King's Guard. He may have been a survivor. I'm just not but that could have been an example of someone who was shameful. That's why yeah. he wasn't named Lord Commander, because he was mm. one of the survivors, and they were a little tainted, perhaps. But... And, and, like, many people in Westeros think that the King's Guard should die apart from their king. They're kind of hard on <laughs> Everybody's like, oh, King's Guard, that's your job. And this goes to show how I, Jamie is, uh, you know, hated so much. Hmm. And, but it's also possible that Grandison was just elsewhere during Summer Hall. But who, where, where, why would he be elsewhere? There's just no ah. other royal family anywhere to guard, and that's their deal. In addition, this is, with Egg facing so many rebellions, he's in this castle with his whole family. The yeah. entire royal family, the Targaryen dynasty, all of them, in a lightly fortified castle. Yeah. So I think he's got the whole King's Guard there. <laughs> <laughs> now, also, we would expect to see Maester Gildane, who we've talked about several times, eventually, Archmaester Gildane. He was the Maester of Summerhall, so he was there, you know, <laughs> guaranteed. Uh, oh. But he would probably be someone relatively trusted, too. If he's the, the Maester at the royal residence, he, that guy would probably be vetted <laughs> for his loyalty <laughs> ahead yeah, of time. Right? Uh, so then we'll we'll get into the royal family. We have the extended family, Betha Blackwood, um, Egg's wife. As stated earlier, if she was alive, she was there. Yeah, uh, Prince Duncan, of course, who gave up his uh, claim to the throne. He would have been around thirty-five to thirty-nine at that time, mm -hmm. a Targaryen by blood, but of course he had given up the family name. Yeah. Then we have uh, his wife, Jenny of Oldstones. Her name, her age is unknown, somewhere yeah. around there. Um, and Duncan and Jenny might have had children. They oh. had been married for around twenty years. If so, they likely would have been at Summerhall, too. Attempting to save them may have contributed to their own deaths or that of the Kingsguard. Now, some might argue that we'd know if they had kids, but I would not agree. <laughs> Duncan had to forswear his rights to the crown, and the entire realm knew this. There was no going back. It was a sealed deal even in the eyes of the High Septon, the Small Council, the Grand Maester, as well as his next-in-line brother, Jaehaerys II. So any children of his would have likewise had no claim to the throne and would not necessarily have been... Considered historically important, especially if they died young at Summerhall yeah. before they could have any impact on history yeah. at all. Remember how secretive the few in the know people are about Summerhall. And again, George R. R. Martin has concealed a lot of the <laughs> details, so this definitely could fit. Yeah, um, we also have um, someone who was definitely there was the ghost of High Heart. Yeah. She claims to have gorged on grief at Summerhall, not because of, you That's know. That's right, yeah, so pretty clear indication there. Yeah. Again, we brought up Shiera Seastar. Yeah. If she had been part of the missions at Ashai and part of this process, you'd think she'd be there to see what happened. Yeah. She would have been about 77 years of age at this time. Yeah, that's a big question. Are we going to be cool to see Shiera in Duncan Eggbugs if she's still around? Yeah, um, yeah I expect we, we will. Yeah, yeah then we have uh, other Targaryens. Uh, we have Jaehaerys and Shiera, who were 34 and 33, respectively. Yep. There's the simpleton Vaela, Egg's niece and daughter of Daron the Drunken. Mm -hmm. We have uh, Daenora, who was the wife of Arian and the daughter of Rhaegal and Allys Arryn. Yep. Or her son, Magor, passed over by the great council that named Egg King Aegon V. He'd only be around 28. Yes. Um... Aegon also had two sisters who had children of their own, but we don't have any word of them. And as they'd both be over 50, it's not unlikely that one or both of them had died already. But we know for sure that if any of these, we'll call them bonus Targaryens, <laughs> were there, they were not survivors. Because of this quote from the World of Ice and Fire, assuming it's accurate. The tragedies of Aegon the Unlikely's reign had trimmed the noble tree of House Targaryen down to just a pair of lonely branches. This quote comes from after the death of Jaehaerys. The pair of lonely branches is Ares slash Rhaella and their then two to three year old Rhaegar. That's it. Uh, it's likely that Shara, Jaehaerys' sister wife, was still alive as he died in his late 30s and she was only a year or so younger. And we know for a certainty that she survived. But if she were to remarry, she'd have to take her new husband's name. She wouldn't have been a Targaryen, so that yeah. wouldn't count. This would, that wouldn't be another branch. Yes. Uh, the king's grandkids, Ares, who was 15, and Rayla, who were 13 or 14, and pregnant with Rhaegar, were certainly there. We yeah. know that. Egg's youngest daughter, Rael Targaryen, which is Robert Stannis Renly's grandmother, and Ormond Baratheon only had one child, Stefan. 
We know Ormond died in the War of Ninepenny Kings, but perhaps Rael died at Summerhall. Yeah, her Maybe. death. Yeah, her death earlier is quite possible as well. I mean, whenever a woman with with an unknown fate in A Song of Ice and Fire has a child while young, then no others, as it is in Rael's case, it's a pretty decent guess that she didn't have more kids because she died before getting the chance, or even in childbirth with the first one. So there are those Baratheon ties too to consider. Lord Ormond married Rael in 245, making their son Stefan age 13. Clearly, if they were there, they survived, as their deaths are well-known in place, so there's no mystery there. <laughs> now, finally, to round out the attendants, we have Egg. He was 59 at the time, and, of course, his wife, if she was there, she would have been around the same, a little younger. And Summerhall itself was a nice 71, <laughs> just a bit older than Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> These people, and whoever else George R. R. Martin has had to kept hidden from us, watched the hatching attempt. All Valyrian sorcery was rooted in blood or fire. That's from Archmaester Marwyn. Yeah. This, sadly, I guess, but also expectedly, <laughs> is where research and evidence gathering kind of comes up short, and George R. R. Martin's intent to keep all this mysterious stands tall. <laughs> Beyond knowing vague things like that quote from Marwyn and that wildfire was involved, we know precious little about the actual ritual. Yeah, the quote says blood or fire, not blood and fire. That said, it is pretty tempting to think blood was involved. We're all too familiar with phrases like, there is power in a king's blood, and only death can pay for life. <laughs> Part of the problem may lie with the fact that this is normally a natural process. Eggs are laid, and then they hatch. <laughs> <laughs> Dragons are magic. <laughs> That's still basically how it works, as far as we know. Yeah. The Targaryens prior to Egg and the Third Dragonbane didn't have to get involved in the process at all. The dragons did what animals do. They just procreated. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all of this uh, confusion and lack of solid info has given rise to quite a few theories about this, though, that we couldn't possibly account for here. Yeah, there's accounts of sacrifice, and if sacrifice, what are we talking about here? Or who are we talking about here? This isn't Stannis we're talking about, or, or is it? Stannis is Egg's great-grandson. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to hatch dragons runs in the family, but human sacrifice does not. Yeah, remember that the fragment said... Seven eggs to honor the seven gods, though the king's own septon had warned... Mm, warned what? Oh, no. That, that, that it, the gods wouldn't look kindly on him, is my guess. Yeah. But uh, given little else to go on, we'll go with uh, common sense here. The people who actually participated or stood close are probably the least likely to have survived. And so let's get into what went wrong. Yeah. Flames grew out of control. Towering. Burn so hot that... Yeah. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, Gildan's fragment indicates that the flames grew out of control and burned so hot that, well, something. The word, <laughs> the word towering is used. Yeah, if there was extra wildfire in hand that was somehow ignited, we could see an explosion occurring. Hmm? But wildfire ignites and explodes easily. So I don't think the end of that sentence is, lit the rest of the wildfire <laughs> and cause an explosion, <laughs> or anything like that. That would be the most obvious of obvious mistakes for the pyromancers to make. And the pyromancers are not only not stupid, we'll show that they're actually overly cautious. Yeah. So while we think an explosion is possible, it's not high on our list, nor is it necessary to explain the level of devastation. No. The, simple, the simplest explanation is that they just lost control. This could mean a number of things, from an outsider to the king commanding something dangerous. A lot of what we know about wildfire leads us to believe that it's just hard to control and chaotic on top of being so destructive. An arrow could be aimed, and a spear, even the stone from a catapult, but wildfire had a will of its own. Once loosed, it was beyond the control of mere men. So, if the ritual was performed outdoors in a courtyard, wind gusts could be deadly. Mm. Perhaps the surrounding stones got fire and spread all around, enclosing everyone while slowly creeping towards them. Or, if indoors, the burning stone could weaken and crack, and from there, if a supporting wall is damaged, well... Quite a lot of the castle could come down, like the Tower of the Hand did here. Yeah. The archers on the walls bent their bows and sent a dozen flaming arrows through the gaping windows. The tower went up with a whoosh. In half a heartbeat, its interior was alive with light. Red, yellow, orange, and green. An ominous dark green. The color of the bile and jade and pyromancer's piss. The substance, the alchemists named it, but common folk called it wildfire. Fifty pots had been placed inside the Tower of the Hand, along with logs and casks of pitch and the greater part of the worldly possessions of a dwarf <laughs> named Tyrion Lannister. Oh, and <laughs> then we have just after that. The Tower of the Hand gave out a sudden groan, so loud that all the conversation stopped abruptly. Stone cracked and split, and part of the upper battlements fell away and landed with a crash that shook the hill, sending up a cloud of dust and smoke. 
As fresh air rushed in through the broken masonry, the fire surged upward. Green flames leapt into the sky and whirled around each other. Not very easy to survive that. <laughs> Plus, the Tower of the Hand is probably more solid than Summer Hall, really, which was specifically built with pleasure, not strength in mind. And so with all of this, you might think that we're building up to laying major blame on the pyromancers for the tragedy. But actually, that's not the case. No. Apart from the fact that it would be at least a little unsatisfying <laughs> for the yeah. great mysterious tragedy of Summer Hall to be based on a simple slip-up by the pyromancers. Come uh, on. That's not very satisfying. Uh, There's the matter of how they took down that tower in a precise and efficient manner, with witnesses enjoying the spectacle. Yeah, Cersei, Tom, and Marjorie, and many others were gathered there. No one seemed to be afraid of anything going wrong. So we're not going to pin it directly on the Alchemist Guild, despite it being their wildfire that wound up doing so much damage. In that case, perhaps someone else, like the king himself, made mistakes. He could have simply used too much of the stuff. He wanted it to be as hot as, you know, volcanoes. Yeah. So he's like, add more, add more. Or he get frustrated that it's not working. Yeah. And, you know, even an alchemist who knows the danger maybe isn't going to say no to the king. Yeah. Maybe, the, maybe, the, maybe the alchemist is also overconfident. I don't know. Yeah. Or, but earlier we showed how easily King Aegon could have been convinced that the implied dangers of wildfire were manageable. And in his mind, a little extra risk might be worth it. This is dragons we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, his dreams could have driven him to do something foolish, thinking his dreams prophetic, like those of his kin. And again, maybe they were, but he misinterpreted them. Or someone else did that for him. Either way, this may be evidence for something worse. The theory <sighs> that Aegon the Unlikely had become or was going insane is an easy enough guess given how Targaryen's past. It's hard to swallow because we love Aegon V, and we have seen quite a lot to suggest that he knew what he was doing, with this one possible exception. Yeah, to be fair, insanity would explain a lot by itself, but I see little reason to consider this a strong theory. The idea of listening to this tiny red-eyed witch, woods witch may seem crazy, <laughs> but if she's right over and over, eventually you gotta respect, right? <laughs> Combine that with the pyromancers and their insistence it could be done. And let's not all be hindsight as 2020 here. From Aegon's perspective, he probably had no idea things could go as wrong as they seemingly did. And then there's his family's presence at Summerhall to consider. He brought them to celebrate Rhaegar's, Rhaegar's birth and to witness this attempt. Some ascribe the fact that his family was there as evidence that he was crazy, but he loved his family, and you really need strong evidence to suggest otherwise, which we don't have at all. Not so close, yeah. <laughs> we both see this as the other way. His family was there because he didn't remotely consider something like this could happen. Yeah, you don't bring your family to a place you think is dangerous yeah. unless you are kind of crazy and I like am. i said this is one of the only things that indicates his craziness the part that might make you struggle with this though is the presence of wildfire that alone speaks to danger right you could say yeah. that puts people in danger and this is his family we're talking about but from Hagon's perspective there is plenty to suggest that safety or at least relative safely i mean we've seen the battle of the blackwater so we've seen this great level of destruction from wildfire but egg all he saw was his brother drinking it, <laughs> which, of course, that's going to kill him, and his brother was insane anyway, and this, during the Great Spring Sickness. Corpses were piled in the ruins of the dragon pit until they stood ten feet high, and, in the end, Bloodraven had the pyromancers burn the corpses where they lay. A quarter of the city went up in flames along with them, but there was nothing else to be done. Aegon could easily have seen it that way, noting the power of wildfire, but not seeing it as the danger we do, given what we know. Consider that beyond this, what Aegon knows is what he's been told by the pyromancers. All the other dangers we're going to be, he's going to ask the experts. Yeah. Even if he considers the dangers in the first place. So he, has his little, he doesn't have a lot of personal experience to go on. This is the kind of thing he would hear, what Tyrion hears in Clash of Kings. My brethren are never careless, Halene insisted. Beyond this never boasting, careless. Yeah. he actually describes this rigid system of discipline that's built into the hierarchy of their order and passed down through successive generations. There will be no mishaps, my lord hand. The substance is prepared by trained acolytes in a series of bare stone cells, and each jar is removed by an apprentice and carried down there the instant it is ready. Above each work cell is a room filled entirely with sand. A mm -hmm. protective spell has been laid on the floors, most powerful, yeah. and fire or any fire in the cell below causes the doors to fall away, and the sand smothers the blaze at once. Not to mention the careless acolyte. Hmm. By spell, Tyrion imagined Haleen meant clever trick. He thought he would like to inspect one of these false ceiling cells to see how it worked, but this was not the time. Mm -hmm. The ones who aren't ultra-careful are basically weeded out in the most final way possible. <laughs> That's right, yeah. The, the uncareful ones just get themselves killed. <laughs> so you know that the higher-level pyromancers have all shown themselves to be very careful. 
So it's part of their organizational culture and practice to revere wildfire and treat it like a sacred thing. And they're a very old order that's been passing these traditions down for a really long time. And they have like this religious devotion to the substance yeah. and it, it, it drives this extreme caution on top of other things. Laxness on their part uh, as the cause for this has been anti-foreshadowed in a way. Yeah. So we're not ruling out error. We just have ample reason to look elsewhere for who made the error or in general to look for other possibilities. Mm -hmm. Now we should consider this angle here. This is uh, related to this precaution from a certain Sir Cold Fingers on Westeros.org brought up on our forums by Wiz the Smith. <laughs> the notion is that Aegon and Duncan the Tall were not killed by wildfire, but by these pyromancer precautions. Interesting idea. <laughs> a part of Dunk's dream of burying his beloved horse in Dorne may be foreshadowing of this. The spade slipped from Dunk's hands. Egg, he cried, run, we have to run. But the sands were giving way beneath their feet. When the boy tried to scramble from the hole, its crumbling sides gave way and collapsed. Dunk saw the sands wash over Egg, burying him as he opened his mouth to shout. He tried to fight his way to him, but the sands were rising all around him, pulling him down into the grave, filling his mouth, his nose, his eyes. Now, in context, that quote maybe doesn't fit greatly, but from what we've seen of Dunk and Egg, there's a lot of sh very subtle references to the future of their arc and to Summer Hall. So I would definitely not dismiss it, even though it's just a yeah. scene of them it's, it's a just Dunk's, And it's just Dun Dunk's dream. It's not like we're saying Dunk has prophetic dreams or yeah, anything like exactly. that. What we're saying is that George George wrote this. Yeah. That he, he might have included some references to it. Definitely. And it's definitely possible as well that the pyromancers rigged their precautions at Summer Hall, similar to the ones that they have in their own well, laboratory, yeah. <laughs> whatever you call it. Their area. <laughs> And just let's assume it just didn't work for some reason. Maybe they just, it wasn't enough. That said, though, the, the mistake a mistake of their precautions, if the sand just didn't work, yeah. it's not going to make things worse. It's just not going to save them the way they may have expected to. So, yeah. But interestingly enough, it could be that Dunk and Egg were actually killed by the sand and not by wildfire. Well, neither sounds terribly pleasant. They're both no. very final, but you know, <laughs> it's an interesting bit of trivia. <laughs> yeah. Um, as we've recounted, there have been a lot of attempts by um, dragonless era Targaryens to hatch eggs. And while many of them have been embarrassing or shameful, none of them got anyone important killed that we know of. Surely sure, not on this scale. We just <laughs> know where like, everyone died. You know, nothing like that. We're talking all or nearly all of the royal family and some members of court. With past attempts, we hear embarrassing words like debacle and failure. We don't hear about death and yeah. you know, mass death. Especially. Certainly no other kings died trying this, but just because the narrative for Aegon V wasn't crazy fits without stretching, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't at least look at the possibility that he was. People who point to House Targaryen as a good reason to even consider it are perhaps overstating the occurrence of Tar Targaryen madness. The idea that half of them are bad might be based on the whole divine coin flip dichotomy of Targaryen personality. But an honest census of the known Targaryens shows that most were sane and capable, far more than half. Still, it does clearly happen, and it is worth considering here. Yeah, if we imagine that Aegon did his research, whatever research that could have mm -hmm. been, we have to give strong credence to the idea that he knew blood magic and or sacrifice might be necessary. That alone is cause to question his sanity. Then again, Maybe there's no writing at all on yeah. how to hatch dragons except for the oh. natural ways. That uh. writing may not exist. <laughs> yeah. And then we have this whole seven eggs business. Yeah, this is weird. Yeah, we're told Maybe. that it was to honor the seven gods. How could Aegon possibly think that this is aligned with the teachings of the faith of the seven? Yeah. What chapter in the seven-pointed <laughs> star is dragon hatching featured there, Egg? <laughs> Is the stranger covering his face because yeah. he's another hidden Targaryen? <laughs> this is definitely at least a little crazy, right? No, actually. Only if he truly believed it. Choosing seven eggs may mm. have been a political move designed to soften the idea of a ceremony like this among the general populace. So yeah. Seven to honor the seven. That makes sense. So yeah, if he was if he was doing this to keep up appearances, yeah, that makes sense. But if he actually thought it mattered, yeah. then that's a point in the delusional column. Yes. <laughs> uh, another possibility that we have to consider, one particularly popular with the conspiracy-minded crowd, is mm. sabotage. Mm. We're not going to worry about how sabotage might might have occurred because with wildfire it really doesn't seem like it would take much. The method is probably the easy part. 
But we will look at a few good candidates and their motivations. Yeah, there are any number of nameless possibilities and, <laughs> and faceless possibilities if you want to consider that the faceless men <laughs> or someone willing to hire them would have an interest in keeping the dragons extinct. No. Yeah. But among ones we can name, there are three more obvious candidates. The Citadel. Now, we can't possibly cover all the different ways the Citadel has shown itself and said to be, or and is said to be, anti-dragon and or anti-magic. Some blame them for helping the dragons to die out in the first place. Mm -hmm. So they definitely have motive, and the idea has been suggested in several places. Like with uh, yeah. Barbary Dustin and uh, Mar Archmaester Marwyn, etc. So clearly they have access as well. And Gildane was there. And perhaps his survival is uh, suspicious. <laughs> yeah, I mean, after all, Gildane is the George uh, Maester, and George loves to kill people. He didn't so. want to kill himself. <laughs> yeah, but um, he didn't want to kill others. Yeah, yeah. That's Gildane, a good point. <laughs> Gildane didn't write about Summerhall until late in his life. Is it possible that he was waiting for the other survivors to die so that they could not challenge his version of events? Maybe. Mm. It's definitely like tinfoil hat territory for sure, but it's not too out there. Yeah, it's not Valyrian tinfoil. Yeah. Little it's, does Gildane know tinfoil. that Ghost of Highheart is there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's still alive. <laughs> Another possibility is Maelys the Monstrous. He was semi confirmed, not involved in Summerhall by George R. Martin and a Sospeak Martin, but it was kind of. Not conclusive because he was kind of refer. The question was asked really badly, and George just tried to correct the guy. So yeah. I'm not. He, he wasn't definitively stating that Maelys had nothing to do with Summer Hall at all. But that said, there are some problems with this. But it does make sense from a motive perspective. I mean, he's a Blackfire pretender, and his interest in wiping out the Targaryens needs no explanation whatsoever. Yeah. The motive is crystal clear, and this guy was already a kinslayer uh -huh. and not an honorable guy. We shouldn't pat, put it past him to do these dirty tricks. But hmm. did he have the means? That's the big missing thing. How could he have afforded to pay for this if it was like a faceless man hit? We're talking about uh -huh. faceless man don't give you all these extra kills. This is, he killed like uh -huh. how many people died at Summer Hall? Like uh, Maelys yeah, could not yeah. afford it to pay for all those. All those lives, yeah. <laughs> that's a lot true. of stuff. <laughs> that's a lot of money. Uh -huh. If he had paid for it, one person would have died. You know, uh -huh. like that's that's how they seem to operate. So. Even if he gave them, like, Blackfire, yeah. that's what happened to the sword, which is a theory we've seen in a few places, that still wouldn't be enough, I don't think. And yeah. also, also because I, I, I'm on, of the opinion that Illyrio has Blackfire anyway, yeah. so and I don't see how Illyrio would have gotten it from the Iron Bank or yeah. Faceless Man or whatever. If they, I mean, yeah. forget the Iron Bank. From the Faceless Man. So, anyway, it's also dubious that the Blackfires of Maelys' era had the same trusted contacts yeah. in the realm that, say, Bittersteel had. Mm -hmm. It seems like their influence started to really die off after the third Blackfire Rebellion, even though Bittersteel was still around for a while. It just yeah. consider how badly the fourth Blackfire Rebellion went. That should give you an yeah. idea. So uh, our final possibility, though, is none other than Ares himself, the old Mad King, who was not yet the Mad King. He was really into fire as we know, and he wasn't bright or cautious or a man who really thought about consequences. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of an astonishing thought, uh, the idea that the future Mad King off most of his family in court. Though, to be honest, it really seems more likely that to be a screw-up than an intentional thing yeah, we're to not me. Yeah, we're not suggesting that uh, Ares, like, intentionally yeah. started the fire at Summer Hall, <laughs> but he may have done it by accident or, yeah. you know, he thought like he was smaller. Yeah, yeah. And there's some evidence he wasn't super into fire, at yeah. that point but that we don't know that for sure that's just yeah. the maesters it was it just became obvious how into fire he was at certain point it doesn't mean he wasn't kind of into it prior to that teenage Aries ruining it for everyone with his pyromania typical <laughs> typical typical but no we don't have any proof of that but it's a very interesting possibility and mm -hmm. we'll be talking about it more uh, later on the conflagration itself let's talk about that to give us an idea of what summer hall might have been like from a rough point of view since we have little somewhat little to go on we finish Using an unrelated character we've brought up several times here, Davos, at the beginning especially. His chapters are the only place we've seen wildfire truly unleashed up close. Minus some more distant viewing by, say, Tyrion and Sansa. From the same battle, though. Wildfire appears several times, but only once is it not carefully controlled, and that's the Battle of Blackwater. This particular scene shows a slow-moving ship with a large ram called Swordfish. With a grinding, splintering, tearing crash, Swordfish split the rotted hulk asunder. She, she burst like an overripe fruit, but no fruit had ever screamed that shattering wooden scream. From inside her, Davos saw green gushing from a thousand broken jars, 
poison from the entrails of a dying beast, glistening, shining, spreading across across the surface of the water. What a great writing, George. Yeah, I, I love that description. That's I have, great, yeah. yeah. Poison the entrails well, of a dying When beast. I was looking, when I was researching this episode, I found that. I was like, oh, this is related to wildfires. This has got to get in here somehow. we got to <laughs> find a way to get this closed. This is actually, I, th- I thought this was a, a good way to use it. Because it's a good example of, <laughs> you know, it's a scene of the destruction and chaos. <laughs> So consider this scene now. Let's look at it from another angle. Change your perception a little bit. Think of Davos as Aegon the Fifth. Consider the names of these ships as members of his family. It kind of, it's pretty cool. Yeah, they fit surprisingly well, really, and I was a little skeptical. I'm going to see brought it up, and I'm especially given all the talk earlier this episode regarding characters represented by metaphorical names. Yeah, I'm not saying George specifically planned it this way. It just fits pretty well. Yeah, it's just neat. Yeah. Then he heard a short shot woof. As if someone had blown in his ear. Half a heartbeat later came the roar. Swordfish and the Hulk were gone. Men, or blackened bodies were floating downstream beside him, and choking men cling to bits of smoking wood. Fifty feet high, a swirling demon of green flame danced upon the river. It had a dozen hands, in each a whip, and whatever they touched burst into fire. He saw Black Betha, his queen, mm-hmm. burning, and White Heart, a man of House Baratheon, maybe a heart, you know, stag, part of the royal family at this point. And loyal man, could be a king's guard, Duncan himself maybe, mm-hmm. to either side. Piety, cat, courageous, mm-hmm. scepter, red raven, raven, raven tree hall, I don't know. Yeah. Herodon, faithful, fury, another Baratheon reference maybe. Yeah. They had all gone up. Kingslander and God's grace as well. Yeah. The demon was eating his own. Yeah, yeah kind of neat. Um... On behalf of the realm, though, Aegon took a shot at restoring the dragons. Whether it would have created the peace he wanted is another matter, but he took the steps he did for the common people and for his family. Whether this was actually a truly terrible idea or the result of sabotage or bad luck, it didn't pay off the way it was supposed to. Instead of dragons born again, there was a weakened dynasty and the relatively short remainder of House Targaryen's rule, a mere 24 years. And it was overshadowed by this epic failure. Hmm. So now we begin our closing ceremonies for this episode. <laughs> closing, <laughs> closing ceremonies. ceremonies. Yeah. So stay tuned after these credits that we're about to do for a preview of part two. And a few thoughts on our continuing efforts to improve the show from a production standpoint. If you have any knowledge on lighting, cameras, or anything like that, um, and you don't want to hear our credits, you can fast forward um, to the end to uh, Yeah, you may notice that. already some differences in this video, but yeah. we're, we're as, as we do with a lot of things, we don't rush into too much. We want to we do our research. We want to we take things one step at a time. Mm-hmm. And we want to make sure it all comes out the right way so that the show improves without wasting, you know, time and money. Okay. All right, our Patreon supporters, Hand of the King and First Lord Cash Craig, a.k.a. Vaxus on the History of Westeros forums. Our Warden of the North is Lord Parker, the Bastard of Starkville, Breaker of the First Stone. Mm-hmm. Warden of the West is Lord Jim the Fortuitous of Castle Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire. Our Warden of the East is George Stormsville, the Cunning Lord of the Chiliad. He's new. New one, yeah. We still don't have a ward in the South. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> Small Council is Master of Coin and First Counselor Lord Robert Jacobs. Master of Whisper is Lord James the Scholar. Grand Maester Itai wears the jeweled collar of many medals. Rosie the Clever, Master of Laws, and Lord James Tuttle, Master of Ships. Thanks a lot, guys. We have had a stable and unchanging Small Council for quite a while. We also have our Night's Watch Lord Commander, George the Golden. Very steady. Hester of Westeros Kingsguard is commanded by Lord Commander Shepard who did not die at Summer Hall. No. <laughs> Sir Troy the Steady swings the Valyrian steel blade fate as the history of Westeros King's Justice. Lady Dyer Liz of Castle Naki is the Alpha Patron. Lord Nathan of the Fire Fort. Dan of the Red Mountains, Lord of Great Bell and Breaker of the Second Stone. Lady April Lauren Boyd Stark of Castle 2BA. <laughs> yeah, her castle's under construction. It's, it's, it's a slow process, apparently. Yeah. Frontier Lord James Knox of the Poker Fort, Hammer of the Dornish Session, mm. and High Chieftain Drew of the Frostfangs, Lord of the Claymore. Yeah. These patron titles are getting cooler and cooler. Uh-huh. We have creative listeners, and some of them have allowed us to pick these names for them. Well, I really hope we didn't forget anyone. Please, please, please let us know if we did. Oh. Uh, there's only two of us, you know. We, huh. we, it's hard to keep track of everything. And also thanks to Rhaenys Targaryen, the insightful Queen of Chronology. And several yeah. members of our farms, Lucifer, Lucifer means Lightbringer, Wiz the Smith, and others. Thanks. Yeah, you can go to uh, historyofwesteros.com slash forums to uh, check out our forums. Uh, we, yeah, we're pretty yeah. active lately. Yeah, yeah, it's slowly growing and surely. The conversations are, are getting better and on a broader variety of topics. So yeah, there was just too much Summer Hall for one episode. 
We almost were able to fit it all in one. Yeah. As you can see, this episode isn't going to be a full two hours, but we have too much to fit it in one, so better to have around an hour and a half, an hour and 45, and then another hour rather than yeah. jamming it all in and trying to talk too fast and missing things. So, yeah. like I said, this one won't be out. It won't be too long before the second one's out. It won't be a full cycle of waiting. Uh, there'll be fun topics like Melee's the Monstrous and Nine Penny Kings who made War on the Seven Kingdoms shortly after Summer Hall. Perhaps seeing it as an opportunity to strike during a moment of weakness. I mean, so much of the royal family destroyed. That's, uh, that makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. We'll also look at Rhaegar. Quite a bit at Rhaegar. One of the most important characters in the Song of Ice and Fire, even though he was dead before the series began. Not only the royal not only the royal family, but the King Guard, as we thought. Yeah, yeah, very wiped true. Wiped out a good time. Yeah, and uh, so Rhaegar spent time at the ruins of Summer Hall and believed in some of the same prophecies that his ancestors believed in. These things are all really tied together. The prince that was promised and the rebirth of the dragons... Big part of Summerhall, all that yeah. stuff. But while Summerhall deeply impacted the life of Rhaegar, it may have impacted his father and mother, though we know precious little about yeah. her. Even more so. Yeah, I mean, doesn't it seem just a little bit strange, or at least curious, that Ares would develop such a fascination with wildfire? I mean, that stuff killed most of his family. Yeah. <laughs> George R. R. Martin loves to fully develop his characters. Personality traits... Don't come from nowhere with this author. There's reasons, there's psychology. The profiles are, are, are well-shaped and sensible and realistic in, 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 a, you know, in terms of, even though it's a fantasy story, these, these people behave in ways that I think we all agree is <laughs> most of the time, if not more often than that even, if not all the time, believable and realistic and thorough. So Tywin's pride, for example, and his hatred of laughter, it derived in part from his own feelings of embarrassment and shame brought on by his father's weaknesses and the scorn heaped upon House Lannister during that time. And then this, in turn, shaped Tywin's relationship with Tyrion and impacted Tyrion's own development greatly. Tyrion also understands and explains this concept quite well. It all goes back and back, Tyrion thought, to our mothers and fathers and theirs before them. We are puppets dancing on the strings of those who came before us, and one day our own children will take up our strings and dance in our steads. And there are so many other examples of this, not just parents, but older siblings. Stannis' lack of humor stands in contrast to Robert's easy, boisterous laughter, as well as other aspects of their personalities. George wants most of us to call Ares a madman and leave it at that. Until researching this episode, I had never really thought much beyond that notion myself, to be honest. But now I think we're both convinced that Summerhall is a really huge part, a major part of what made Ares who he was. Yeah, really. I mean, this is a really traumatic event. Terrible enough that the mature adult survivors largely refuse to talk of it. Witnessed by an unstable mind at a relatively young age? Yeah. How could that not leave an impression, if not some sort of PTSD um. on Ares? So... That's all for today. Hopefully that preview gets ex gets you excited about the next episode. Mm -hmm. Now, we like we said, we wanted to have a brief chat about what we're trying to do with our lighting and camera and all that. It's actually trickier than one might think because we have a lot of different ways we use the camera. There's things that you yeah. can't do with some cameras. You can't have a certain camera. It can't be running for two hours straight. Yeah, like we, we record our episodes. They're, two, they're just two hours long. And you might say, okay, we'll just split it up like record 30 minutes at a time or something like that or do shorter episodes but we also do those uh live streams and have guests and google hangout where we have to do it for two hours and so we have that issue and th the main thing we've come to realize is that maybe we should just uh use our webcam for those episodes and get a new camera and do it in pieces for our um most episodes just because it, one, would be easier on us. We would be able to do it in sections, take a break, stand up, like stretch our legs. It's hard sitting here for two hours straight <laughs> talking. Uh, so that's one option. Another option is maybe you know something more about cameras and you can tell us that it really doesn't ruin the camera that much. Mainly, we don't want to buy a very expensive camera just to, like, ruin it. You <laughs> yeah, know, yeah, like, yeah, we, that's just kind of a waste of money. We're trying to become professional, and you don't get there by destroying expensive yeah. equipment <laughs> when you don't have a huge budget. <laughs> yeah, so maybe if you know something more about that, you can send us an email um, at westeroshistory at gmail.com and let us know about cameras. But we also have the issue of lighting. Because, you know, it, it's tricky to light things. Like, people do that professionally. It's not just something you just jump into. Yeah, we, uh, we, didn't, we didn't think it was a big deal until we started to try to learn how to do it. And, and, uh, and you can tell from this episode, if you guys are, you know, may have noticed, the lighting is different this episode. We're, much, we're, we're happy with this change. But 
one because one of the things we learned as we went through the process of trying to research cameras is everyone said all the people that we talked to were like first figure out your lighting yes then do the camera because yeah. that's just you just start that's the yeah. basis like this is the same camera we've been using for a long time but it looks like much clearer just so much more clarity just because lighting it's brighter on us and so the camera is better able like webcams aren't very good with dark darkness they're the lighter the better basically and so the light has really like made it just made it look a lot clearer i think you, everyone will notice uh hopefully you'll notice um what we did was we got um three different like clamp lights with led with like led lights so that they don't get too hot because we run them for two hours again so like we can't have lights that get hot um and we just pointed them up at the ceiling we're trying to look into diffusing them in some way through like sh you know diffusion gel silk sheets which is it's very complicated so that that's again why we included this that if anyone knows anything about lighting i don't care if it's very minimal we want your advice mm -hmm. we're interested right as as a lot of things we we come to our listeners and our forums and things to get ideas for our episodes too it's this is the same concept we're reaching out to our own community seeing if it could help out some people like people like to, to donate money and time. This is another way for someone to, to join in and help out in a way that could help the show out a lot. And of course, anyone who helps us a lot, you get a, yourself a nice shout out on the show yeah. too. So looking forward to making more improvements along those lines. This is this is a first in the step of many things we have planned. Of course, we've talked about some of these things in the past, but to rehab, to rehab, <laughs> recap, it was like rehash, I'm trying to say rehash, rehash and recap at the same time. We're going to try to start adding in a few more visual things, maybe a map here and there. We haven't we're one thing at a time like you said we're working on the camera stuff first but we want to maybe yeah. have quotes for the youtube videos having the quotes on um, picture would be nice yeah on 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 itunes we put the quotes with reverb so they really stand out what's the more recent change that we've done yeah. so that's a, a good thing we want to make more things to make the uh the quality and just the overall production yes. better yeah we so, gotta figure that out of course we also have this issue of the long episodes two hour episodes editing a two hour episode you can imagine that's like a rule of three basically that if 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 it you times it by three, basically. If, yeah. if it takes you two hours to record an episode, it's going to take you at least six hours to edit the episode. And so that's for audio. If we're adding in video, we t add. It's like it could add a lot of time um, onto that. So again, we're interested in anyone who has input, who has ideas on that. Um, it's yet another issue that we do not want to start doing it unless we're going to do it right. We don't want to do it, realize it's too hard or takes too much time, and then not do it anymore. Yeah, that, we, that's not our way. Yeah, we want to figure it out. Things are solid. Run with them, not make mistakes. Mm -hmm. So we need to be because it's important for us to be efficient. Anyway. Yeah. I think that explains things pretty well. Yeah, that's uh, that's what's been on our mind recently. I'm mm -hmm. um, in this interim time, along with our episodes. Well, yeah, so. along with bringing this episode. The other yeah. cool thing about having two summer hall episodes is that people in between, you know, we get to hear your feedback on the yeah. episode from a, a narrative point of view and say, hey, you guys talk about this theory, or we didn't we didn't hear you mention this. So it allows us to kind of circle back yeah. and to take in your feedback and do mm -hmm. uh, take your feedback into account and incorporate yeah. it into this next episode, yeah. which I like I said. About 10 days after so, this. So, during this episode, we talked a lot about Dunkin' Egg. Uh, one very, very, very exciting thing coming out. It's all the way in October, October 6th, but um, the night of, a night of the Seven Kingdoms is coming out. It's, you know, a compilation of the three Dunkin' Egg novellas, mm -hmm. all in one. But the, this is the really exciting thing, is that it's illustrated by Gary Gianni, who he's just fully illustrated, like, hundreds, like, 200 illustrations within it. Um, and he did one of the Song of Ice and Fire calendars. I think it was 2014, 2013. I forget which year. We have him. But uh, he did one of the calendars. He's a very good artist. Um, and they recently, uh, on I'll put a link in the YouTube description. They saw so some samples of some of the art. We've seen, like, six pieces of art from the book so far, all black and white. It's very cool. But you can pre-order A Night of the Seven Kingdoms on our website, Uh Right there. It's no extra cost, as yep. always. Through, through Amazon.com. You can also check out, like you said, the 2016 calendar. It's yeah. great. World of Ice and Fire still available. The calendar comes out, and uh, it'll be out by the time you see this episode. All right. Likely. And, of course, the latest Telltale Games is out. It's, it's We've heard that it's the, the best one yet. We haven't, uh, we haven't, we're, we haven't we're played it ourselves yet. We're still in the first two so far. Yeah. We need to catch up. We, just <laughs> we need haven't... to catch up on that. We're a little too busy with, yeah. with this. I'm sure you guys <laughs> prefer this to us playing the Telltale Games. <laughs> yeah, but, but, we'll, but it's not a huge time investment. We, we so. would like to talk about it. We'd like to do a discussion-style episode um, during this interim season. We'd like to have, you know, maybe have Radio Westeros back, have some other people to talk yeah, about Yeah, definitely. It. Now, one last note before we say goodbye. Um, we're a couple, like I said, there's a couple new Patreon milestones, but I'm not trying to 
you know, bring more attention to that, so to speak, in terms of trying to generate support for it. I just wanted to explain what they are for other people who aren't going to even bother looking over there. Uh, we're going to try to do more Q&A episodes. It's the next milestone. And that will include bringing back some guests. A lot of the, our response to the wrap-up episode was great, uh, uh, the meaning the uh, award show. And we, the, having all those different great personalities was a really big plus. And there's, it's something we can leverage more in the future, having great discussions about certain topics. So we've been having some discussions offline about who to include and what topics to, to discuss and what to bring up. We're still working on the next Blackfire part, Blackfire Part 3 with Stephen Atwell. We'll hopefully do that by the end of August, August 2015, in case you're listening much (laughs) later down the line here. You never know. And, of course, we're still working on the book to show support group for how to deal with all the things we've been spoiled and might be spoiled on next season as well. How to deal with that, how to manage it, and how to think it through how to keep it separate in your mind, things like that. We're still working through the mm-hmm. ideas. It's a, it's a, it's kind of an interesting notion, but <laughs> uh, you got to kind of drill it down and figure it out and have it make more sense, put it into words. <laughs> we want it to be yeah. efficient when it comes. All right. Well, I think that says it all for now. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And we will be back very soon with part two of Summer Hall, which I think we're going to call the Shadow of Summer Hall. Mm, that's good. Cool. All right. Valor Margolis, everybody.